A month ago, I put out a video on the Nexus Link WB1750 wireless gaming bridge and using it as a Wi-Fi hotspot for fast and reliable wireless VR gaming with the Oculus Quest 2 headset. At the time, I used the automatic settings to get up and running as quickly as I could. But what if you needed to tweak those settings because something wasn't working quite right? Or maybe you're trying to achieve a more reliable or maybe even faster Wi-Fi connection because of your Wi-Fi situation. What's going on everybody? Today we are looking at some of the simple manual settings that can make a big difference in your Wi-Fi experience. Before we jump into that, I want to send a big thank you to Nexus Link for setting me up with the WB1750 wireless gaming bridge to demonstrate this process. NexusLinkUSA.com is a one-stop shop for many of your gaming networking device needs. Powerline networking units and coax to ethernet adapters can give you a hard-lined ethernet connection practically anywhere in your home. Have a hard-to-reach spot in the house for internet or an older home without ethernet jacks in every room? Or one that doesn't really allow Wi-Fi to transmit all that well? Try the WB1750 Wireless Gaming Bridge Kit and extend the reach and speeds of your internet to keep gaming in all corners of the home. Have an older printer without Wi-Fi that just doesn't need to be in a main room, but there's no way to put it anywhere else? Try a power line adapter and hide that printer away so it's not taking precious space on your desk anymore. There are many things to choose from and Nexus Link has a solution for you. Go to nexuslinkusa.com for more information about all of these devices and more. We want to start by making sure we have the unit connected to your router somehow. The reason we want to do this is the automatic settings in the unit use what's called DHCP. I'm not going to go into the background of DHCP because the only thing you need to know right now is that you need an IP address similar to what's probably already on your laptop or desktop. Connecting the WB1750 to your network will allow it to be identified and assigning an IP address that is within the rest of your network. This just makes things much easier to find. If you don't and you hook up your computer to the unit and the unit just has power and nothing else, to get the device to adjust settings, you'll need to change your PC's IP address by hand and go through a bunch of things that are really just a pain in the ass. For this demonstration, I have a WB1750 with a networking cable going to the network switch attached to the rest of my network and another ethernet cable attached from the WB1750 to my laptop. I can do this wirelessly, but I'm a fan of hardwiring a computer whenever possible, so making the changes were all done hardlined to the WB1750 itself. To get into the unit, we first need to know the IP address of the access point. I use a program called Advanced IP Scanner. You can find it free online, and I'll leave a link in the description below. It's really easy to use. Make sure the WB1750 is on your network, power it up, and Advanced IP Scanner will grab the proper range of IP addresses to search and pull a list. You may have to sort this out and figure out what one it is. The easiest way is to match the MAC address from the unit to the MAC address in the program, and that line will have an IP address. Enter that into your web browser. The default username and password according to the user's manual is root and 12345. The password for the unit can be updated in the admin menu option. Now that we're in, we can look around the system and see what we have. First set of menus have the current statuses of the unit, what mode it's in, as we see here the device is set to access point mode, also called AP mode. The other setting is base station, and in this case it's noted station. To see what that does, check out the original video on the WB1750 Wireless Gaming Bridge Kit that comes with two units. You can find that up in the corner. The status menu, labeled Wireless, has the current settings for the wireless portion of the unit. From here, they are not editable, but that is below under the config menu. We see the interface and MAC address for the radios, the band, channel, and channel width. In this device, it's called bandwidth, and I'll explain what that is in just a second. The networking status menus show MAC addresses for your device, but more importantly, the IP address the unit can be found under. I'm not gonna get into WDS or MBSS in this video. It's because we just don't have to worry about any of that right now. Down to the config menus, we'll be able to adjust a few things that could really change your Wi-Fi experience, so that's where we're going to focus. First menu is the wireless settings. 
The ESSID field is your network name. You can change this to whatever you'd like, but make a note of it, or you'll be coming back in here to find it or resetting the device to factory and starting all over. The Scan AP button next to it is a feature that shows us how many wireless devices there are around us giving off a signal to connect to. Some of these devices in the list can be wireless printers or things like discoverable devices like Chromecasts or smart TVs, so there could be quite a few in there. Everything else is more than likely a Wi-Fi network around you. I don't know if this helps, but I think of Wi-Fi like this. I think of it like a car radio. As I pass through cities or towns, I gain and lose airwave strength for that radio station. The more radio stations trying to use similar frequencies, the more interference that I'll get while I move around town. Which I know is usually impossible, but for the sake of argument, today they can. What ends up happening though, is they just try to talk over each other and it just causes problems. And this is exactly what happens when you're in your home and have Wi-Fi networks all around you fighting for the same airwaves. As we see in this list around me right now at this very moment, channel 40 only has a few devices broadcasting on it. Other channels have many, many more, which are basically fighting for airspace and interfering with each other. But that's where the channel field comes in. We can use the new knowledge to our advantage. In this case, we'd change the channel to 40 instead of auto. The problem with this is that the connection around me or other devices that auto switch their channels, like this one would if I left it on auto, means tomorrow, midday, channel 40 might have a ton of devices connected to it, and I may end up with a poor Wi-Fi experience. Choosing a channel is definitely trial and error when you have many other radio waves trying to transmit at the same time in the same space. This can be especially problematic if you live in an apartment because of the close proximity to others. Some people would say just get a device that you can increase your power output, but then you turn yours up and the neighbor turns theirs up and then it's just a vicious cycle of blowing other people's radio waves out of the way for yours. It's not very neighborly of you to do that, so just think before you start adding more power just to overcome other people's Wi-Fi connections. The Advanced tab has one thing we need to be aware of. It's a setting called Bandwidth. This is the simplest way that I can describe this, and for all the people out there that say you could have described it like this or that, just leave your explanation below. This was hard enough to try to fit into a small video as it is. Bandwidth, also called channel width, describes how wide a broadcast frequency you can put out. This is an oversimplification, but hopefully it will cover what you need to know. A narrow channel width of 20 MHz will cover a total of one channel, 40 MHz will cover two channels, and 80 MHz covers four. The best way this was explained to me was this. I think of the channels like a highway. Everyone needs to pick a lane and use it. If somebody has a lane that's set to 20 megahertz, they stay in that lane. If somebody has it set to 40 megahertz, they can take up two lanes, which means they can transfer more at the same time as the person at 20 megahertz. At 80 megahertz, they get four lanes. The more lanes, the more bandwidth. However, not all devices work this way. An older device may only understand 20 or 40 MHz, which means if you set your unit to 80 MHz, that device may not even connect because it doesn't know what to do with the extra lanes of data. Some devices may have a setting that shows 20, 20, 40, 20, 40, 80, which means that it can auto-negotiate and allow for older devices with different requirements. So now if I have the channel set to 40 and the width set to 80, theoretically I will be using three extra lanes to speed up my Wi-Fi connection. The next setting someone may want to adjust is the passphrase. It's your Wi-Fi password. You can change it to something you'd more easily remember if you wish. If you forget it and you can't get in, you can always factory reset the device and start all over. You can change the encryption mode as well, but I usually leave it default unless I have a device that doesn't connect to that encryption method, and then I have to do some adjustments. Skipping down to networking, here we can select if we want a static IP address or not. Personally, I like to have my managed switch, printers, all of my access points, and desktops set to static IPs. It's just so I know what IP address they have at any given moment when I'm doing network maintenance. 
but there are risks with it when it comes to duplicate IP addresses on a single network, so use caution if this is your first time setting a static IP. Also, no, it probably doesn't need to be said, but a static IP will not make your Wi-Fi faster, but it will make your access point easier to find because the IP address won't have changed unless you reset the device. All right, everyone, those are the settings that I look for when I am trying to tweak my Wi-Fi. I know there are probably many other videos out there about these settings, and some may go into greater detail, but this is the core knowledge you would need to know, and this should get you closer to where you want to be. Thank you again to Nexus Link. They provide some great devices out there, so check them out at nexuslinkusa.com. And of course, if you like this type of video, hit thumbs up, get subscribed, and hit the little bell to get notified when the next video comes out. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day.